conversation around education have changed people's thinking like, oh, let's rethink the system itself. Like, why are we making students do this? Why is it based on time in the seat versus what they know? I think any parent would be very excited about the idea. Their child being treated more as an individual, the instruction being personalized more than an individual child needs. I had just gotten married and, and uh, my aunt, uncle, and their three kids came. Uh, their daughter was the oldest of the three. She was 12 years old at the time. Mm -hmm. And it just came out of the conversation that she was having trouble with mathematics. Um, and she had taken a placement to test at school and it was actually putting her into the slower math track. Oh, okay. And so, you know, I, one, I think, I don't think my, her parents realized how big of a deal that was. Mm -hmm. Because in middle school, if you go on that slower math track, it has implications the rest of your career. Uh, and I also thought, I was surprised, does Nadia seem like a very bright, hard, hard working girl, why, why was she being this happening? And she told me she could, just couldn't get it, whatever else. Uh, but then I offered to tutor her when she goes back to New Orleans and she agreed. And so starting fall of 2004, uh, we used to start, you know, literally on the speakerphone uh, every day after work for me after school for her. Every day. Almost every day. Almost wow. every day. Wow. For, for, for the first month, it was almost every day. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, at, at first it was difficult, and, but then she kind of, things started to click. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, not only did she catch up with her class, she actually started getting a little bit ahead of her class. Uh, they allowed her to retake a placement exam. She got put into the advanced track. Uh, and the same girl who in seventh, entering seventh grade mm -hmm. was being placed into a slow math track okay. by 10th grade was, so this was three years later. Uh -huh. She was now taking calculus at the university. So then I started working with her younger brothers, um, and actually the, the second one, he actually just got into MIT, so I'm very excited about that. So, uh, you know, the first few months it was like almost every day, after that it came a couple of times a week. And I started writing, the first Khan Academy, notion of Khan Academy, was I started writing uh, interactive exercises for them, so that they could practice. Uh, the, the concepts we were going over. And then I started making, uh, I put a database behind it so I could keep track of what they were doing. And then I, I started making reports for myself so that I, as a tutor, could see what they were working on, what they found easy, what they found hard. So that was the first Khan Academy. Was, and I actually got the domain name ConAcademy.org, which was for that. There were no videos at this point in time. Uh, then you fast forward to 2006, 2006, in November of 2006, where a friend of mine kind of said, hey, you know, to help yourself scale up, yeah. uh, why don't we make some video lessons and put them up on YouTube? And I said, I said, oh, that's a silly idea. YouTube is for, for cats playing piano, not, <laughs> not serious mathematics. You know, those first videos were really just to be a supplement to that software I was writing. Uh, you know, hey, if you're getting confused by this problem, here's a video for you. But then it soon became clear that the videos, people were watching it. After a few months, I, you know, I, I kept asking my cousins for feedback and you know, they someone famously told me that they, they liked me better on YouTube than yeah. in person. Yeah. Like the concept of the mole, balancing equations is one of those ideas that you learn in first year chemistry class that tends to give a lot of students a hard time. And just when I said I have one aluminum here and I have two aluminums there. So maybe a simple thing is just to put a two out here. So now I have two aluminums on this side and I have two aluminums on this side. The aluminums look happy. Now let's look at the oxygen. Here I have two oxygens. So I just kept going and I realized that uh, it was, you know, after about 80 videos, I was like, you know, that's a decent scaffold of algebra. We now have 600 videos in algebra, but even 80 was pretty good. And I said, yeah, maybe I can trigonometry, geometry, physics, calculus, and I kept adding more and more and more videos. At that same time, yeah, so this was my hobby, and it obviously felt good you know, when I started getting letters from people on the internet saying, hey, this really helped me, uh, this, this helped me pass my exam, this helped my kids, this helped me go back to college. So it just felt really good. Another issue is, I think, it's, it's a common issue, which is, you know, Nadia's case in particular. She was a good student. She did everything that she was told. She was hardworking. But the way our system works, if you don't get one concept, you're you're never going to get it. You know, the way our system works, and this is a system whether it's in Taiwan, whether it's in California, or whether it's anywhere on the planet, the students they're grouped by age. They move together at the same pace. 
uh, you know, they get some lectures and some concepts thrown at them, then they get an exam. That exam, some students get an A, some students get a B, get a C. But if you get a B or a C or a D or whatever, even if you get an A minus, it's viewed as a judgment on you. How smart are you? Uh, and, and that even though the assessment is saying, well, this very basic concept, you're missing something. The Bernadette's unit, even though you're identifying, you ignore it. And you move on to a more advanced concept. And so as you, as you keep pushing students further and further ahead like that, you're pretty much guaranteeing that they're going to have gaps in their, in their knowledge. And those gaps, even in an algebra class, might end up being gaps on units or gaps on multiplication. And there's no way to address it once you're in an algebra class. And so I think the, the benefit that I was able to give to my cousins, even through software, through my direct tutorial videos, was this gave them a chance to uh, practice and learn all of those gaps that they had been accumulating their whole life. Uh, it allowed me as a teacher to see what those gaps were. You know, I, I, I would be trying to teach my some cousin adding fractions, but then I would realize by looking at the dashboard that, hey, you're actually having trouble with the, the multiplication part of it. The find the least common multiple. If they could get that, then they could add the fractions. And so that's hard for a teacher to get that information normally. But now I can get that data because I have the, the data from the computer. Um, and then the videos allowed my cousins and other folks, and now a lot of folks, to to access knowledge without feeling embarrassed or shy. Uh, what's valuable about the videos are no one's going to judge you. You can get your own time, your own pace. If something in the video is confusing for you, uh, you can pause it, you can ask someone else, you can look at another video, you can look it up on the internet. Uh, so it gives a lot, it, uh, a lot it, it personalizes the experience and it makes it a lot more safe for the learner. I think what is probably the most misunderstood concept in all of science, and as we all know, is now turning into one of the most contentious concepts, maybe not in science, but in our popular culture, and that's the idea of evolution. And I want to be very clear here. Even though this process did happen, that you did have creatures that over time accumulated changes that uh, maybe their ancestors might have looked more like this, and eventually they looked more like this, there was no, there was no active uh, process going all on called evolution. It's not like the apes said, "Gee, I would, I would like my kids to look more like this dude." So somehow I'm going to get my DNA to to to, uh, to to get enough changes to look more like this. And it's not like the DNA knew. The DNA didn't say, "Hey, it is better to be walking than to be, you know, kind of." hunched back like an ape and so therefore I am going to try to somehow spontaneously change into this dude that's not what evolution is it's not like I think the things that Khan Academy has helped bring about was one to just to surprise people that a, a, a not-for-profit site that's dedicated towards real academic learning has this much traction. It's changed the conversation around education. They're still having some of the traditional conversations, how many students should be in a room, how much money should you spend, et cetera, et cetera. But hopefully, the combination of Khan Academy and even some of the ideas in the book have changed people's thinking like, so let's rethink the system itself. Like, why are we making students do this? Why is it based on time and deceit versus what they know? Um, why is the same institution that's teaching the students is also grading the students? Maybe there should be separate. Uh, an institution. Uh, why is it that when we give a grade to a student and if they have weaknesses, we ignore it and we tell them they're stupid yeah. and then we move on to the next concept? Why don't we why don't we ensure that they master that concept so that they're more likely to master future concepts? You know, why does the classroom have to be about lecture? Why can't it be about interaction and, and projects and whatever else? Yeah, you know, in a traditional school model, you go to a classroom, you sit down, you put your finger on your lips and the teacher starts lecturing. You can't talk if you talk, you're reprimanded. And the curriculum is, goes at a pace that's set by the teacher or by the state. This week we're going to do this. All right, class, today we're going to do this. And what it makes you, it turns you into a very passive human being. You do exactly what the teacher tells, but nothing more. And you become like, okay, what's next? Okay, teacher, what do I do next? But in today's world, it's all about being creative, taking initiative, being able to define the problem yourself. And, and, and products of our existing system actually, a lot of them have trouble with that. How do you learn new concepts on your own? How do you define your own goals, not someone else defining it for you? 
And so what we're seeing, and this is you know something that is obvious now, but I, I, it's a surprising side effect, is a lot of the classes that are using this more self-directed, hey, what's your goal? Why don't you try to achieve this? You set your goal, I have to teach, I'm going to try to help you reach your goal. It, it, it changes the student's mindset. Instead of saying, oh, teacher, what do I do next? They say, hey, I want to achieve this goal next. This is my plan to achieving that goal. And they and what are the tools, whether it's Khan Academy or other resources, the teachers, their peers, what tools are there at my disposal for me to reach those goals? And that's obviously valuable for just learning, uh, but it's incredibly, it's a, that's probably a more important life skill than knowing how to factor a problem. Mm -hmm. So I think we've helped change the conversation a little bit, I think. Um, you do have even major universities, Harvard, MIT, Stanford, now, you know, very seriously creating their own uh, online in, uh, interactive tools, and a lot of that is for them to rethink their on-campus experience. And when you have universities like that saying, yeah, we shouldn't be giving lectures anymore, we should make it interactive, that's going to, that's going to have systemic effects throughout all of academia, throughout all schools, because people will look at those universities and say, oh, well, yeah, they're getting rid of lectures, we should get rid of lectures too. I think in all subjects, there's an element of your core skills. In math or science, it might be, you know, understanding how to manipulate an equation or understanding some of the basic properties of something. But then there's a deeper level where you learn to apply them, where you learn to uh, build things, uh, experiment, and so similar to the humanities, that there's a there's a layer of just core core knowledge. What happened to Germany in World War One? Uh, what was what did the Ottoman Empire look like? Or you know, I mean, these just basic facts. Um, and then that gives you the tools so that, that you can then participate in the deeper conversation. And so I think the same thing is true. What the videos and the exercises can do, and actually, even show you, we've been doing it in history. Actually, uh, that's what I was doing right before you walked in. Yeah. Um, they give you a, a, the big picture of what's going on, the scaffold. And, and even there, there's, it's subjective, right? I mean, if you if you ask a, a Japanese and a, or a Korean about the early 20th century history, they'll have very different opinions. Um, and so it's a subjective thing. What we try to do is give our, our best, try to be as intellectually honest as possible. But then on top of that, it's out there for everyone to view and comment on. So if people disagree, they can comment on their own version of events, as long as it's respectful, we can quiz people on it, and then that gives people a scaffold so that they, they can then have a conversation when they go to the classroom. And eventually we want to have some type of, you know, where you can write essays, and other people can give you feedback on your essays, sort of the more subjective things. Mm -hmm. So I, I think it's, you know, there's definitely a part of the humanities that we can definitely address already. Mm -hmm. Well, so it's all available, all the tools that any of the teachers have, anyone can log in, it's all free. Um, for a student, it allows to see where they need to go, what they need to do next. We're about to launch a whole set of features around uh, personalizing it, so you can take a diagnostic. As a student, you can get, uh, you can, you can advise you on what you can work on next, give you feedback, make sure that you master a lot of these concepts. Uh, then as we go, uh, you know, for the teacher, for the parent, they can use that to see what the student is doing, what's their strength, what's their weakness, uh, where should the teacher intervene to make sure that the student understands the concept. Uh, for us, we get to use all the data to improve the product itself. What are people watching, using, what are they not using, how do we make it more engaging, how do we make sure that people learn the concepts for longer. Exercise every major language in the world. Two, I hope to cover literally every major topic. So definitely every major academic topic, uh, you know, kindergarten through college, uh, uh, but then also professional topics, you know, whether it's accounting and, uh, you know, even things like, you know, uh, electrical work, or, I mean, we're already doing medical school, uh, you know, I don't know, legal training, I mean, eventually, you know, in the next five years, I'd like to cover all of that, uh, and just interactive exercises in all of that. In the next five or ten years, I would expect to see us have started a lab school where we a lab, a healthy real school that I think you're going to see um, even richer ways, just talking about the last question, for people to create creative things on Khan Academy. We're already doing that with our computer science platform where students can create programs, share it with their friends, save it in their portfolio, get feedback from people. And so we would like to do things like that in writing, we would like to do things like that in music composition. Uh, you know, you can imagine a whole, a whole bunch of areas where that would be interesting. You know, what we imagine is, 
you go to an environment, mixed age groups, so you could have a six-year-old and an eight-year-old and a ten-year-old and a fifteen-year-old all in the same room. Uh, some aspect of the day is you're doing stuff that's appropriate for your level, but then you bring the students together for shared experiences. Maybe some of the more mature students or the more advanced students are mentoring or leading, which is an important skill too that's not taught in, in traditional schools, leading some of the younger students where they get the mentorship and they get to look up to these students. Um, uh, interspersed with a lot of free time for exploration and creative. I would imagine a day that is roughly one third kind of core academic, uh, but it's going at your own pace and your own time. So it's going to be far more productive, uh, but that's personalized. And, and you are getting peer to peer instruction, but it's core academic. I'd say about a third of the day would be uh, structured exploration where you are, you have your mentors who are helping you create something or make something or design something. Um, and then a third of it is literally free play. Well, we don't know the answer. We don't know what's going to be the right answer for every classroom. I don't think it will be the same for every classroom. It will be different. Well, I think what, what I, I think I can reasonably say is that the people have been talking about computers and learning for a long time, uh, you know, even before the internet. I think my personal belief is we are now at a point that's actually happening. Uh, that's for real, um, but we're at the very, very, very early stages of it. So there's going to be some successes. There's going to be failures. It's and, you know even you know all of the, everyone involved is just going to have to have a pretty open mind and, and experiment and really figure out what's working and then try to uh, scale that up. Uh, but in the next, I would say, ten years, you're definitely going to see kind of blended learning becoming fairly mainstream.